So boost your creativity with art. My name is Adinda and I'm very excited to give you this webinar together with the Curious Muse community. We'll wait um, maybe one or two minutes um, for uh, others to join us. They might be doing their dishes now or might be underway um, and might not have noticed me popping up in their screen. Um, I'm very curious for the people who are already uh, live in this webinar, where you are from. We have a live chat function that you can use um, in my screen. All the, the chats will pop up. So please let me know, maybe with a thumbs up that you're there and the chat is working or let me know um, uh, which country you are from. Um, can someone use the chat just to be sure that it's working? <laughs> it's my first time giving a webinar, so I'm kind of uh, trying to figure out um, um, how this all works. <laughs> I'm also very, very happy. Oh, hey, yes, thumbs up. Thank you very much. Good to know that it's working. Um, I'm very happy to give you this uh, webinar um, and to uh, show you ways to teach yourself a new way of looking at the world and how to increase your creative power. And during this webinar, which will be around 30 minutes, I'll give you an insight in my own brain and I'll uh, let you know um, um, what we can uh, give you, um, our curious muses, um, what kind of tools we can give you to boost the creativity in your own life. Hello, Colombia and hello, Bulgaria. <laughs> nice for you uh, to join us. And hello, Italy as well. Wow, all over the world. That's pretty exciting. Um, so... Uh, Let's start this great, oh, the USA, hi. Um, so let's start this webinar first off with uh, why and uh, we need art and what art can do. So here are four photos of um, things that we've seen the last couple of weeks and months. Uh, the photos show activists who all wear uh, t-shirts that say, just stop oil. And these activists have uh, either glued themselves to famous artworks or have thrown tomato soup over paintings to, um, to send a message. Um, they are doing this to get more attention for um, um, uh, something that they care very much for, for climate change. And, um, even though you might not agree with their method, it does show us how art can send a message because everyone in the world can probably agree that uh, we need to keep this heritage. We need to keep these, these temples that we call museums, these great institutions with knowledge, the institutions that are um, creating for us um, a kind of a, um, a safe space of, of what humankind has ever been and where humankind came from. So what I want to show you with this uh, slide is uh, art can send a message, but art can do so much more. And in which ways you can boost your creativity. Uh, the platform and the community and I have created in the last couple of months and of course we'll end with what kind of tools and lessons you will learn uh, when you join us uh, in this course. So let's start with me. This is me, Adina van Veli. Um, I can see in the chat function that you're, you know, all you guys are from all over the world. Hello Philippines and UK. Uh, I am myself, I'm from the Netherlands, I am Dutch and I am an art historian. Um, I'm 32 years old, um, and I did several bachelors and a master's. Um, the fun thing is that up until I was 17 years old, I always thought I would become a journalist. I always loved telling stories. I always loved exploring uh, people's minds and, and news as well. And there's a part of me that thought that if I wanted to become an anchor, a news reader, I only had to work for one hour a day. Boy, was I wrong when I discovered it's a full-time job. But when I was 17 years old, my um, French class and I went to Paris. The fun thing about being a European is that within a couple of hours, you're in a different country. And I went to Musée d'Orsay, which is, um, in my opinion, the most beautiful museum in the world. Um, and I saw a painting by Claude Monet. And I remember being mesmerized by this painting. I just had to stand still. I just had to look at it. I kind of got emotional as well. And I just couldn't take my eyes off of that painting. And then and there, I thought... If I 
can can keep this feeling if i can do something in my life to get this feeling all the time all the time i think i will be a very happy person and boy was i right because uh, since i studied cultural heritage art history specifically 19th and 20th century art history i have had the absolute pleasure of working with with and for museums uh, art collections uh, in my professional life and um, during that professional life I also discovered that most of the work that I do is behind a desk, like a lot of people do nowadays. I was just sitting, typing, talking very often, but I wasn't really very inspired, um, which is uh, why I decided when I was still studying, the painting <laughs> was A Woman with an Umbrella by Claude Monet. Uh, look it up after the webinar. It's mesmerizing because her face is covered um, with a, a shawl and you cannot really see the expression on her face, but I felt sadness and a sadness that um, me and myself as a teenager felt at that time. So I, I was kind of that woman with an umbrella at that moment. <laughs> but um, during my professional life, I discovered that most of my work was just sitting down. And what I also thought was weird as a student was how I was trained to become an art critic without actually knowing what it's like to know the struggles uh, of an artist. So I forced myself to find a hobby. Uh, I forced myself to find and do something creative uh, with my hands. I didn't want to become a painter or I didn't want to paint because I love painting so much. It would kind of crush me if I wasn't very good at it. But I did discover photography. And um, a lot of my time I spend um, in museums. And um, the fun thing is that um, I'm, of course, never alone in, muse in a museum. And I just love watching people uh, going from artwork to artwork. Sometimes they're standing still. Sometimes they're taking their time. Sometimes, so sometimes they're just walking past. So as kind of my own portfolio, um, I created an Instagram account called Museum Admirers. And I um, quite often post uh, photos on it um, from people in museums looking at art, uh, which is very meta because I'm looking at people looking at art. Um, but it did, did give me an insight in creativity because I thought um, uh, it, it's very easy to take a photograph. I mean, every idiot with a, an iPhone or a smartphone um, can call himself or herself or themselves uh, a photographer. But it's very difficult to be a creator. It's very difficult to be creative. And um, creating something with my own bare hands kind of forced me to understand what creativity meant for my, my own life. Um, either as a professional uh, and also personally. Um, I tried to put these thoughts um, in an, um, uh, an amazing opportunity I got a couple of years ago. When I was 25, I was invited by TEDx Utrecht. Utrecht is one of the, the largest cities in the Netherlands to do a TED talk. Um, I was a, a very young student, um, but I already was trying to figure out um, what the best way was to explain to people why I fell in love with art and art history. And uh, during this TED talk, I explain how uh, first impressions kind of never uh, last. Because in the first 0 0.4 seconds that you meet someone, you will immediately um, have an opinion about that person. Either you like them or you don't like them. Um, and the same goes with artwork. Sometimes I'll see a painting and I'm like, man, it's not really my style. But if I force myself to just stand still, take a couple of minutes to look at it, to explore the painting, I always get a second impression, which lasts longer than the first one. The second impression for me is always better than the first one. So I created three uh, questions that I explained in this TED Talk. You can find it on YouTube as well. Um, it's called The Art of Looking Twice. And I always ask myself, what do I see? It's the most easy question to, to, to ask yourself if you're looking at a painting, what is it that I'm seeing? And the same goes for people. What is this person? What kind of person is this? Um, and then I ask myself, what kind of techniques are used to give me this impression? What kind of techniques are used to show me this? Um, in artworks, it could be uh, someone that paints abstract or uses very bright colors or quick brush strokes. Um, and so forth and so forth. Uh, for people, it could be a mask that they're putting up, um, um, a, a version of themselves that they want to show you. But then you need just to sell, ask yourself the question, what's the story behind this first impression? Why did the artist use this technique? What kind of 
um, message is this artist trying to show me? And for people, it goes the same way. Why, why is this person um, presenting themselves the way they are? Is there a story behind it? And more often than not, I'm actually quite surprised by people if I, um, for instance, at first glance, don't really like them. But if I just start asking questions, you can figure out that everyone is interesting. Um, so that's uh, all this all this together um, makes that I'm uh, always thinking about what creativity is and, and and why we need it and how we can use it in our everyday life. And the need for creativity is not a modern idea. This is the era of self-help books. And it's most definitely the era of self-help books on creativity. I think this got a boost in the last couple of years during the pandemic when COVID forced us to be at home alone with our thoughts. And we discovered that most of our thoughts might not be very nice. Um, a lot of people, professionals, writers, professors, journalists have created tools for us, books to... I think all these different um, ways of looking at creativity, because when in this webinar I talk about creativity, I don't really mean um, sculpting or photography, but I mean creativity as a, as a way of thought, as a way of thinking and looking at the world. And I think, and this is my personal view, this is why Curious Muse asked me uh, to do this course with them. I think people look for creativity and need it in their lives because it can help you uh, in problem solving, for instance. Um, you might have a problem that you have to deal with. You might approach it in a very rational way. But if you try to find a more creative way, you might find uh, different solutions. And if you would just be a very quick uh, in your judgment or very quick in your opinion. And the same, go, same, go, same goes for decision making. If there's a very tough decision you have to make, you can um, um, follow your gut feeling, you can follow uh, rationalized thoughts, but you can also um, explore different creative ways um, to make the decision that might impact your life very greatly. And of course, as an art historian, I need to tell you that we can learn from the past. It's very difficult to have an original thought nowadays. Um, so we should look at the people that have lived before us. We should look at the mistakes they made, the decisions they made, the solutions they figured out. Um, learning from the past, learning from other people's creativity can boost your own as well. And maybe one of the most important things in my life, creativity means... Um, processing thoughts and emotions. For me, standing still is one of the most important things that I, I have to do because my, my days are filled with work and, and lots of um, changes and lots of things happening in the world. Modern life is hectic, it's overwhelming. Um, and creativity, even if it's just looking at a painting, um, it can help you process thoughts and can help you stand still for a second. So in this course, how to read a painting, um, we're looking at 10 paintings, 10 modules. Um, after this course, uh, which consists of 52 videos, uh, you will have a general understanding of modern art. We're starting in the first half of the 19th century and we're ending it in the second half of the 20th century, so almost 150 years of art history. You'll have a, a, a general knowledge of many different art styles as well, because modern art changed rapidly in a very, very high pace. Um, sometimes uh, artists were also expert in different kinds of styles that overlapped, which is always very cool. Uh, Picasso might be the, the best known modern painter and artist uh, who was such a chameleon and, and was the founder of several art styles. You'll have lots of fun facts and anecdotes on famous painters, and you will uh, receive the tools uh, that I'm explaining to you right now, the tools that I use to analyze a painting, not just uh, during the course, but also during the rest of your life. So it's very tough to find a selection of 10 paintings in 150 years of modern art, but we made a selection. Uh, this is just um, eight out of 10. 
And if you look at it for a bit longer than 0.4 seconds, you might recognize a couple of them. Let me know in the chat if you know one of these paintings. Do you know the title? Um, do you know um, maybe the museum where it's in? Have you ever seen one of the paintings in real life? I'm very curious, please let me know. And hello, Arabella from the Netherlands. Leuk je te ontmoeten. When I was making this webinar, by the way, I, I'm asking you to, to put in the chat the, the title um, uh, of one of the paintings that you know. Um, uh, please let me know if you've ever seen one in real life as well. I'm very curious. And the fun thing was um, when I was creating this uh, webinar uh, and during the course as well, I uh, figured out that I haven't seen every painting in real life. So um, I'm making it my goal in the next year to see all of them in real life. I do. I have seen most of them. Sunflowers by Van Gogh, exactly. The one in the, the lower right corner. Um, we saw it earlier in the, the slide um, from the activists because um, they used the London version of the sunflowers for their message. The scream. I love you're using the, the scream emoji as well because it's definitely inspired by the painting, The Scream by Edvard Munch. Okay, so it's good, good, good to know that you know a couple of these paintings. Um, there are two paintings that I'm not showing you in this slide and that's because I want to use them as a sneak peek uh, for the course. So um, we're starting the course with uh, Francisco Goya's Saturn Devouring His Sun, which is in the upper right corner. And module number two is about um, uh, Edouard Manet's uh, painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe. Edouard Manet was a French painter and he lived in, in the 19th century. He was part of a very uh, big uh, socialite group, uh, a bourgeoisie group of uh, artists that are now very famous. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Impressionism movement. Um, he was also very well loved by the French Académie. And the Academy was um, the institution in Paris that would decide if an artist was either in or out. Um, and he created this painting in 1863. And it's a subject of module number two of this course. Now, we always start off um, in a course with an introduction. And I always explain uh, how the artist has inspired others. And uh, you can see here two examples. Um, uh, on the left, you can see the Simpsons version of this painting. And I cannot stress enough how amazing the Simpsons is in giving all these odes, all these uh, recognitions uh, in their, what is it, 33 years of existence to uh, a lot of famous paintings. It's kind of pretty cool. Um, this moment where you see can, this screenshot is very quickly. But if you know this painting, you, you might just... Um, bounce up and say, hey, I've seen I've seen this painting before. And the same goes with Lego, uh, who also uh, create, recreated this uh, um, amazing painting by Monet. <laughs> Something that we also always do during a module is um, figure out left is by Francisco Goya, who Manet absolutely for the uh, in the uh, Parisian Academy. One of his teachers was Thomas Couture. The um, painting on the right was created by him. And there's such a big difference between these two paintings. Um, Thomas Couture adored dramatic anatomy. That's maybe the best way of describing this. Everyone in every figure in this painting is just beautiful. They're dramatic, they're voluptuous, their anatomies are very muscly. muscly. Um, this is just a very pretty painting, um, very harmonious um, setting as well. Uh, everything about this painting is correct. And it's also a nudge to uh, history because history paintings were the most popular paintings uh, back then when Manet was a, a, a student and a painter. But as kind of like a, um, an exercise against this style, he wasn't afraid to show people um, ugly. 
could have been an inspiration for Mendez to make. Um, so uh, in every module will uh, themselves. It could be peers. It could be it could be people, um, um, uh, grandmasters from from decades before or centuries before. But we always uh, take a look at what someone has um, sometimes copied from others, but also found um, inspiring to use in their own work. Something we also do is not just look at the painter itself uh, and, and um, the place where they were living, uh, but we also look at what, what the world was back then. And sometimes um, small changes in the world can be revolutionary for uh, um, something like art. So this is a photograph of the invention of the tube. Uh, before the 1840s, artists uh, would create their own paints and would uh, almost always uh, paint inside a studio because if you're outside and you've mixed your paint on your own, your paint might dry very quickly, um, which is something you don't want because you want to use the colors that you've mixed. Because of the paint, um, sorry, because of the paint tube, paint can be preserved. So for the first time ever, artists uh, could paint outside uh, the Impressionists used this uh, paint tube very often. Um, and the Impressionists got their name because uh, uh, someone once said, this is not a painting, this is an impression of a painting. The Impressionists would go outside and had to paint very, very quickly uh, because um, the change of the sun in the sky, and if the sun changes, form and color all around you changes as well. Imagine... Um, the, the blue hour, for instance, the hour before the sun sets completely, the entire world just becomes uh, blue. Um, so the, the painters of, the, of Impressionism, and Manet was one of them, um, had to paint very quickly. And that's all due to uh, the invention of the tube in America in 1839, I think it was. And we always end with a discussion and, and um, um, an analyzation of the painting itself. So close your eyes uh, for a couple of seconds. And when you open them, try to see the first thing that your eye is attracted to. And let me know in the chat. So close your eyes and give this a, a second impression. So close your eyes. Open them and let me know in the chat what the first thing is that you see in this painting. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I'm very happy you're enjoying this webinar. The faces of the man and a woman. And I, yeah, the man, uh, the man and woman on kind of the left side of the painting, right? And Manette did this on purpose because, um, Andrew, well done. Um, because Edouard Manet used a trick that many painters use. The human eye is attracted to the most lighter parts on a surface. So with that knowledge, we can understand exactly the extremely pale skin contrasts with the dark shades of the background. And Manet did this on purpose because the subject of this painting is not a luncheon on the grass, it's this woman. So what do we see in the foreground? We see three figures, one woman fully nude and two men fully dressed. In the background, we, we see a second woman um, bathing. She's standing in water. She's wearing a, a white dress, but it's very see-through. And in the foreground, we see a picnic. We see some um, blue cloths. We see some um, uh, fruits and vegetables and um, other food. Um, so what kind of techniques uh, is Manet using here? Well, what he is using... Um, is this woman? <laughs> he is kind of use. He is sexualizing this woman because it is a nude woman, uh, and our eyes are attracted to her right away. But she's looking straight at us. And this painting was rejected by the Parisian Academy, even though they loved and adored Manet. But they just couldn't handle the fact that this woman was just straight looking at us, uh, the audience. And she was very unapologetic about it. I mean, the men are definitely engaging with each other. They're talking. The woman in the background is bathing. But this woman in the front is very unapologetic about being nude. Now, the story behind this painting, um, the story that Manet is trying to show us, is the French bourgeoisie. So uh, um, kind of an upper level, uh, rich, 
um, dandy kind of group of people, the men, who have invited two women uh, to the forest to enjoy a picnic. But the whim women are kind of nude fully. Um, and Manet, this is Monet's way of showing us how prostitution in the 19th century would sometimes occur as well. And during the course, uh, we'll look at more symbolism in the painting. Um, maybe look this painting up later on and see if you can find the frog that's in the painting because the French name of a frog um, was also the name back then um, that was um, used to describe a, a loose woman. So Manet used all these kind of hints and symbols in the painting to show us the real story uh, behind this um, picnic in the park. <laughs> so um, Manet is one of the earlier um, uh, artists that we'll discuss, but we're also, of course, discussing Frida Kahlo, who um, is one of the most famous female artists ever. For a reason. Frida Kahlo was a Mexican painter and she created uh, this painting, the Henry Ford Hospital, in 1932. Frida Kahlo has had a boost in popularity in the last couple of um, decades. Uh, she died in 1954. Um, not many art histori historians. The feminist movement uh, got a boost. Frida Kahlo. Um, oh, is it your favorite? Yeah, Frida Kahlo is one of my favorites as well. Uh, while I was just making this course uh, and I was reading up on her, I just felt very empowered. This is such an inspirational woman in, in every aspect of, of her life and, and her work as well. And Frida Kahlo is still an inspiration for artists uh, nowadays. For instance, uh, this beautiful photography by uh, Caroline Sikink. Um, it shows that not just Frida Kahlo's work uh, is an inspiration for people, but also her persona, because she was um, kind of theatrical in the way that she presented herself with the flowers. She didn't use... Um, she did use much makeup, but she was unapologetic about the facial hair that she had. She always dressed up in traditional Mexican clothing, um, and she was always very proud. And I think that's something that women sometimes forget to be. We are allowed to be proud. Um, and Frida was, definitely. Now, Frida Kahlo was inspired by many things. Um, so these are just two examples. But Frida Kahlo was a very proud Mexican woman as well. And she was very much inspired by Mexican folk art. And on the left, uh, you see an example of Mexican folk art. Um, it is what lots of art historians in the past would have called prim primitive, primitivist, sorry, difficult word, primitivist, because it doesn't really ana um, anatomically uh, show us correct figures. It's a very childlike way of, of telling a story and, and uh, showing a narrative. But Frida Kahlo definitely got inspiration from this type of art because it, it's very colorful. Uh, it fills the entire canvas. Uh, it shows different stories on just, just one palette. Um, and she was inspired um, by this kind of work and used it in her own work as well. And the same goes for this uh, Dutch artist, Jeronimus Bos, who created the most amazing detailed where is Wally uh, painting ever. It's on th uh, three panels. And this is just a detail, but she was so amused by um, the figures that he created, the fantasy figures. She does that as well in her work, um, mostly in symbolism. Um, all the different kinds of stories uh, you can find in just such a small palette. Jeronimus Bos is definitely... Um, uh, very detail-oriented, but also very good at his craft. And he was an avant-gardist in the fact that he um, had to create artworks uh, for uh, the church, uh, but he always decided to make it kind of gory, kind of gruesome with fantasy figures, kind of weird as well. Uh, and she absolutely loved that. And so it has a, a big inspiration for her own creativity. Um, but one of the most important things was not the paint tube in her life, but the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution was from 1910 to 1920, and uh, afterwards people had this uh, huge boost in morale. Uh, that's also um, uh, why um, Frida Kahlo dressed in the traditional Mexican 
uh, clothing because she wanted to to express uh, and be proud of her own uh, nationality. Um, and a lot of her paintings, like most of her paintings, show this as well. So if you know this, next time you see um, one of her paintings, try and look at all the clues of her Mexican heritage. Now let's ask you again, if you close your eyes and you open them and you look at this painting, what is the first thing that you see? In total, the canvas uh, shows us, of course, a bed with uh, a woman lying in it. Uh, she's surrounded by six figures, objects, symbols that are all connected to her belly um, with a red string. In the background, we can see a very modern city. Um, and of course, one of the most noticeable things um, in this um, painting is the fact that the nude woman is lying in a pool of blood. Yes, the baby is definitely one of the first things that you see because she put its center uh, in the middle of the painting. Um, the baby is the, the main subject of this painting because uh, Frida Kahlo had just arrived in Detroit together with her husband, Diego Rivera, um, and she created uh, this artwork after she miscarried. She actually lost this baby boy in the Henry Ford Hospital. And I told you before, creativity, even if you're not a painter yourself, can help you uh, cope with grief and loss. And this is exactly what Frida Kahlo did. She lost a baby, she lost a part of herself, and she grieved by creating these, uh, again, very unapologetic, real, raw paintings. Um, she wasn't afraid to show her true character. This is actually a fun, fun weird fact. The first time that blood, um, fem female blood, uh, is shown in a painting. Um, and she was just she wasn't afraid to show her true self, and she wasn't she didn't want to censor her um, her grief either. And this is this is the most amazing thing probably about Frida Kahlo, uh, because she, she is a symbol for for women all over the world. She created this almost a hundred years ago, and still everyone in the world who sees this painting can immediately sympathize um, for this woman. And when she was a young teenager, uh, when she was a teenager, she was just 18 years old. She had this horrible accident with a tram uh, and she had to be uh, in bed for long stretches of time uh, because she had to recover. Um, that was the time where she um, she started drawing and painting. So even though she had a, a horrible accident, uh, she wasn't very mobile. She, she lost her freedom. She turned it around by creating, by making, by enjoying herself, um, by exploring this gift that she had. And it's horrible to say, but I'm kind of happy she did because otherwise we wouldn't have this amazing, empowered woman, Frida Kahlo, who are, we are still talking about now. So let's look at the checklist. You'll have a general understanding of modern art when you join us in this course. You have a knowledge of many different styles. You have some uh, fun, uh, crazy, weird facts and anecdotes on famous painters. You have the tools to analyze a painting. This was just a very small sneak peek on what we'll do in the course. But you will also have more fun when you visit a museum. Um, you will have, uh, the general knowledge will um, kind of um, give you the, the tools uh, to, to explore new secrets that are hidden in paintings that you might have not have noticed before. And I hope that you understand that for me, standing still is very important. So looking at art is looking at life as well. Stand still, take a moment to just, you know, understand what's going on in your life, not in a museum per se, but maybe in your personal life or your career. Um, just try to get a second impression to um, understand people uh, better. Um, and also boost your creativity by learning how to ask the right, right questions. Um, what do I see? Um, why is it shown to me this way? And um, is there maybe a different story behind it as well? So this course that we've created has 10 modules, 10 paintings. Um, it's uh, online uh, tomorrow, this December 1st, uh, in the YouTube description, but also here on this slide, you can see... Um, the codes uh, for discount uh, that you can use. Um, you can also sign up in the link in the description. 
Um, and I hope you will join me uh, in this amazing tour of 150 years of art. And um, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention in the webinar now. And I hope you will join me because if you join me, you can become the most interesting person in the room. <laughs> so this was the webinar. Um, I will be here for a couple of more minutes. If you have any questions, please ask me. I had lots of fun seeing all your chats uh, here. Um, it also comforted me because I was very nervous. I've never done a webinar before and it's very scary not to see your faces. <laughs> um, if you have some feedback, that's okay as well. We always love learning. The entire Curious Muse community is about learning and discovering and exploring. Um, but for now, I want to thank you very much. And um, I hope you will enjoy the course. And during the course, you can always give feedback as well. Um, let me know what kinds of, of paintings you enjoy most. Uh, do you have a favorite out of the 10 paintings um, that we've selected for this course? Do you feel that there is a painting we definitely missed? Is there a painting that you think, no, they should have put that in the, the selection of 10? Um, uh, yeah, so please let me know. And um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Stay brave and fearless. I love that. Thank you very much. <laughs> So if you haven't signed up already for the course, please do. It will be great to expand this Curious Muse community and learn from each other as well. The course is already live, sorry. <laughs> of course, it went live during this webinar. You can sign up today um, and definitely use the discount um, codes, uh, creativity504030. Um, you might want to give it as a present for your mom for Christmas maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've started the history of beauty by Umberto. I really still want to le uh, read. Um, but thank you for reminding and on art and on beauty. Um, I'm wondering, Christina, uh, is it um, is the history of beauty perhaps the booster of your creativity? It's also so fun that all you guys are from different parts of the world. It's so cool. So thank you, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. It's been wonderful presenting this webinar to you. I hope I will see you soon. Um, and uh, thank you again for your time and enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.